Today on the show, Timothy Ballard. As a Homeland Security agent, he was rescuing children who were the victims of kidnapping and human trafficking. On one mission, he went overseas to rescue another kid who had been kidnapped and trafficked, and what he found was horrifying. Hundreds of children all being taken from their families, sometimes orphans, split apart and trafficked all over the world. Now, Timothy Ballard travels overseas, sometimes literally kicking down doors to rescue children and other victims of human trafficking. You will not believe this episode of The Jordan Harbinger Show. Here we go. You're, uh, you're just traveling like crazy, huh? I guess that's the job. Oh, yeah. Yeah, all over. It's nuts. Yeah. Wow. Even if even in the uh, pandemic, hey? Yeah, there's been... A, I've, I've limited it for sure, but uh, yeah, we're still having to move things around and yeah, it's never stops. The, the, the child crimes has increased, in fact. Really? Like fourfold during the pandemic. Yeah, it's, hor- it's horrible. Really? Uh, why, because- why is that? Well, the, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children reported in excess of about three to four million additional um, reports of child sex abuse in April, in March and April, because all the infrastructure that keeps kids safe is down. The schools, after school programs, they're, they're, they're told sit here, they're, they're, a computer is shoved in front of their face, mm-hmm. and, and that's it, you know, and, and, and they don't have a lot of supervision. We got these, so we, we track the dark net, right? See these pedophiles are all around the world and they're, they're talking about harvest time. It's harvest time. Ugh. That's how they find the kids. And they are out of jobs too. So they're home, the pedophiles. Uh, the United States were the number one consumer of child sex videos in the world. And so our kids are just exposed. Mom and dad scavenging for food, trying to survive, trying to you know, save their businesses and whatnot. And these kids are just, I mean, it's in, in April it was... In March, it was 2 million in excess of March 2019 reports. And then in March, it was like double that, like almost 3.5 million in excess of March 2019. My God. And it's a tsunami right now. It's just horrifying. No one's talking about it. It's, I'm, I'm trying to get that. I'm actually writing an op-ed right now that, uh, about it. Well, that's what was so surprising about this. And, and did you write the book yourself? Because it's really good. I did. I, yeah. I didn't have a ghostwriter. I, I wrote the safe. Yeah. Jets. I mean, pardon me for being surprised. It's not you. It's that uh, no, nobody no, writes no, no, their no. book anymore. Yeah, I get it. No, I get it. But yeah, I, I, I did. I, I love, I, I love writing and it's, it's been my therapy for, for dealing with <laughs> going undercover and, sure. and pretending to be a pedophile. Uh, I've just read and write is kind of my, has been my therapy over the years. So Th- that's good. I, I, I am, I'm surprised not because Oh, this guy's a you know officer, and those guys can't. It's not nothing like that. It's eighty percent of the people I interview. I'm like, sure. hey, this is great, and they're like, oh yeah, hold on, let me find that part in the book. I'm like, didn't you write? How do you not remember the, you know? And they're like, I had a ghostwriter, which I understand. Yeah. Look, I yeah. get it, yeah. I get it. Um, yeah. I, I also, I think it's really cool how you frame the book about African American slavery in the United States. That was something that really stood out to me, and it. A couple of the things that you'd quoted from these little sidebars that you have, uh, one was that there was a a slave who wanted to learn so he wanted to learn how to to read so bad that so they could read the Bible. And I think the quote was something like, "I just want to be able to read so that I know how to live. That way, I won't be so afraid to die." Yes, that was powerful, man. Yeah, and the risk they were taking, you know, that Harry Jacobs was taking, and that he was taking, you know, like we we could be whipped, we could be. Uh, just beaten to to death. Yeah, and and they said, we don't care. Let's do it. Let's do it anyway. I just I just love her spirit. I I tried to write my that book that story many many times over the years, and I I would just this is embarrassing, but I I just couldn't emotionally. I, I would just fall apart. I mean, even getting th- writing that story, I just I was ball and just PTSD type reactions. And um, but until I until I had Harriet to kind of lean on her story. That's what actually made it possible for me to write it. Um, she's been, I mean, as I, as I write in the book, she's my hero. She's my teacher. She's my inspiration. And, you know, if she could do it under her circumstances, uh, being a slave, certainly I can figure out something. I can do something here, you know? Yeah. Uh, just, she's just, uh, she's just a powerhouse. And um, I, I, uh, I wish more people knew about her. Yeah. Well, the, the book, I, when I read it, I, I was really surprised because I thought, oh, this is going to be like a little treatise from a ex-cop on 
the slavery industry or the child trafficking industry. And it really is like this African-American slave story that tells the same, unfortunately, the very similar story of what we have going on right now, although this happened hundreds of years ago, which is all, so in a way things haven't changed and looking at some of the stats, it's gotten even worse. And and we'll get into that in a second. I just, I thought that was an especially hopeful story or part of the story coming from somebody who had lived a really hard life and honestly didn't have a whole lot of hope to live a better life and they still were trying to improve themselves that was that that's amazing really absolutely yeah it's just it's it's unbelievable and and again like you like you pointed out it's, it's the, the slavery is different it's different i don't i would never want to you know lose the integrity of 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 the transatlantic slave trade in that story for sure but there's enough parallels that we're we're just so crazy not to try to learn from what happened before, how we eradicated it before. And, and just like in, in the eight, in the 18th, 19th century, no one's really talking about it. It's, it's too hard. People look away. They don't want to engage. Uh, and, and so again, there's so many parallels. How do you create a movement? How do you get people interested in the suffering of, of others? And, and, uh, the, the, the children don't have a voice, you know, they can't protest. They can't rally. They can't organize these children who are abused. They're, and they're the most precious in the world. And yet you don't hear, there's no marches for them. There's no, and that's why we're just trying to get loud and, and try to be their voice because they're being exploited, trafficked, kidnapped, raped by the millions more than ever in the history of the world. So it's, it's, it's something to, to hopefully bring to light and, and find solutions. People don't know this. As you mentioned, people don't really know this. There's not, there aren't that many marches or there are, if there are any, I don't know of one. There's 30 million slaves in the world. Is that correct? I mean, that's yeah. insane. It like, is correct. Think yeah. about countries that you've been to on vacation. Like maybe you went to Sweden once and isn't that like five or seven million? So you can add up all of Northern Europe and you have, maybe you have like more slaves than those countries pop entire population and they're just blended into the rest of the world. Absolutely. 10 million of those are children who are either enslaved labor, organ harvesting or sex trafficking. The most, most stats UN state department uh, believe that in terms of the sex trafficking is about 2 million, but we work in the slave labor as well. I'm, and if you're a slave for labor, you're a slave for sex. I mean, once, once someone owns you, they're going to do anything they want with you. So I think those numbers are even lower than, than what we're seeing. And it is absolutely devastating. And it is everywhere. You know, the United States, we just we just landed last year at the Trafficking in Persons Report. We're in the top three for destination countries. In other words, the traffickers are trying to get these kids into our country and into our black sex market because that's where you can make the most money. Again, we are the demand. We drive this. Uh, we are the number one consumers of child exploitation material, what I call child rape videos because that's, that's what they are. Mm -hmm. That that to me is bizarre, but also somehow not surprising because it is a big country and we have, we keep stats on these kinds of things. Like it's hard to say if there's other huge markets for this, right? When countries that maybe just don't even care as much, I would I would think. It's exactly right. We, we, we're, the, we're one of the largest countries in population that also has high tech so and that we, that we do take stats for it. So it's, it's true. Um, but, uh, you know, we need, we need to start here. We need to start here. And so, so often people say, look, this is a problem far, far away from me. It doesn't affect me. It doesn't affect my family. No, it, it does affect your family. Believe yeah. me, if, if you knew how many sex addicts, pedophiles are living in your neighborhood, you, you, would, you would take care of your children a little differently even. So it's 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 a problem we have to just, you know, bring into the light. I just want to pause for a second and, and let the numbers sink in, because when I first heard that stat, I I literally put the book down and just like I was walking outside. So I, I just kind of walked another couple blocks because I was like, how many and I was doing population calculations in my head, like how many people live in California? OK, like 60 million, I think. And I was like, OK, so if we divide, it's just a huge, huge number of people that are enslaved. And if a third of them, if 10 million of them are children, that's the that's po more populous than many countries in the world. And they're all child slaves, just like when you kind of did that, that whole put everyone in one room kind of uh, exercise. What's the size of the business? How much money are we talking about here? It's a $150 billion a year business by most est estimates. Uh, so... To give people an idea, that's like w w the, the, the amount of money made every year selling children, selling people 
is about equivalent to, you, with that money, you could buy every single Starbucks franchise in the world. You could buy every single NBA franchise, every team, and still have enough money left over to send every child in America to college for four years. Jeez. That's per year selling human beings right now. So Believe this is a yeah. huge business. The, there's, it is enormous. The, you just can't ignore the economics. I know I mentioned earlier the transatlantic slave trade, and again, not to marginalize that at all. I just wanted to highlight how bad the problem currently is. Like There are more people enslaved right now than during those four centuries. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. Ugh. Yeah. Unbelievable. It's So now, of course, maybe it's not based on race, but it's just pure. Is, is it purely economic? Is that really what we're it's talking like, about? It's it's pretty much all economic. You know, back in the in the transatlantic slave trade days, that was clearly race issues sure. and so forth. But today it is economics. It's it's just it's it's a ton of money. I mean, these criminals, that's, this is why it's the fastest growing criminal enterprise. It's 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 catching up to drugs. It already passed, surpassed arms. And, and the reason is you can buy you can sell a bag of cocaine one time, but you can sell a child. 10 times, 20 times a day in a 24 hour period. And that's what's happening to these kids. Yeah. And so it's, it's so lucrative uh, for the, the, the criminal enterprise. I know you got started in Homeland Security investigate. Were you, did you start off investigating sex trafficking or how did you even fall into this? Cause it's, it doesn't seem like something people normally seek out and go, this is my beat, you know? Oh man, I did not want to do that. In fact, when I was in the Academy, my, my wife and I made a decision and a, a pact that I would never work child crimes. We hardly touched it, by the way. This was like in early 2000s, the child trafficking. It wasn't really, no one was really talking about it. But I ended up, uh, I studied terrorism. That's what I, I was in grad school during 9-11. I mean, I, I, and I got my degree in national security with an emphasis in terrorism and weapons of mass destruction. So that's what I went in to do. And that's what I was doing. I had my dream job. I was on the border. Uh, we were tracking we uh, weapons and potential connections to, 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 to groups like Al Qaeda and so forth. And six months into that job, I get called in and my boss says, we're starting a child exploitation group, an, an anti-trafficking trafficking group. And I, I said, well, great. What did that do with me? I don't even know. I didn't even really know what it was, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. Like how big is it? I didn't really know. And, and he says, wait, we want you to be part of it. And I just, I, I said, no, at first I, I had to go back and talk to my wife. And, and I told my wife, you know, my wife said, this is crazy. You're not going to do this. We have children. Yeah. You're going to bring darkness into our home. I, I don't know, want that in your head. And by the next morning, it was my wife as I'm preparing my, my speech to reject the position. And I'm scared that, that I got to tell this guy who's my boss, his name's Larry Frost, big guy, you know, uh, intimidating to me. Uh, and I don't want to, you don't tell this guy no. Right. And so I'm thinking, how am I going to say this? What am I going to do? And my wife comes up to me while I'm preparing my, my speech in the bathroom, looking at myself in the mirror and she's in tears and she's not a very emotional person. Um, you know, not, she doesn't show it that way. And she's in tears and she said, I, I didn't sleep at all last night. And she said, I'm wrong. For the very reason we thought you couldn't do this because we have kids is the reason we have to do this. If it's true that millions of children aren't experiencing the childhood like our children have, safety and security and love and protection, then how dare us worry about our own pain? And she sent me off. She said, you got to do this. It's got to be yes. Mm -hmm. And and so I went in. I said, let's do this. And, and, and honestly, Jordan, it was about 10 10 times worse than my mind could have conceived what I was getting into. Yeah. Uh, the things that people do to children, I could not comprehend. I, 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 to this day, after 17 years of doing just this, I cannot comprehend. It seems like the kind of thing where, well, you had a front row seat. So for me, I watched the documentary, read your book, and I was like, these numbers, are these real? But you had no prior warning, and it was probably like, oh, there's going to be the occasional kidnapped kid who's getting trafficked. Like, well, what are we going to do the rest of the time? You know, like, why am I going to fill our days up? And it's like, <laughs> you must have, I mean, was it like a hundred times worse than you expected or ten oh, times worse? It, it was so bad. The, the amount, first of all, the amount of child rape videos coming in, that's kind of where we started. That's why they started the group. It's like, what is going on? We, we go online in the dark net. Um, and we're just learning about what's what these things are anyway, and and it's just this tsunami of material of children being 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 raped, little children. People think we're talking about sixteen and seventeen year olds. We don't even have time. That's illegal too. Mm -hmm. We we rarely have time to even focus on that. We're looking on the kids who are five, six, seven, ten years old, 
And so I remember one of my very fir- my very first case. They sat down and said, "Tim, investigate this case. This is this is a uh, child exploitation material. It came in. It landed in in our area of responsibility. So find this guy. He's here somewhere." And I pull up the stuff that we had found, and it's these little children, these three little boys. And I won't get too graphic, other than to say they looked like my children. And I, I mean, I I fell to my knees. I dry heaved into a you know, I thought I was going to throw up. I was just dry heaved. And, sure. and, and I, I, I ran out of the building. I mean, this is not, I'm not proud of this. This makes me look like super wimp, but I mean, this is just what I think happened it's a normal to me. reaction. I think it's a normal reaction. I've never seen anything with people that young, but I, I can't even like my mind can't even, it's hard to even get there. You know, imagination wise. Oh, you can't, you can't get there. That's why when I'm watching these kids were like six, seven and eight, my kids ages. And they looked like my kids. I, I get in my car. I speed over to the school I checked my kids out. I put dentist. I remember <laughs> I took him home and I just, my wife came up, what's going on? And I just was sobbing and just holding my kids. And mm. I was just like, you don't know the evil out there. And, and it's, it was hard for me because I would, from that point on, I would superimpose my children's faces on all the victims that we would try to help. Like mentally, right? Mentally. Yeah. I would just mentally just like, that's my kid. That's my kid. And I had to get over that to, to even move on. But then I realized, that's why I realized why are we not having marches and why are we not having demonstrations about this? And the reason is, is because pe- it's too dark. People will do the same thing I did and they can't, it's too much. And so I know this when I present, I thank the audience just for being willing to hear me. Mm-hmm. I thank you, Jordan, for being willing, even being able to give me an audience because it hurts so much to think that this could be real. It's easier to pretend it's not. And that's what we're up against. I think you're onto something there. Because when I first saw this, I think I was introduced to you through this documentary, which we'll link in the show notes. It's available. Is it Amazon Prime or something like that? I always recommend yes, these Yes, Amazon things. Prime, yeah. And it's called Operation Toussaint or Toussaint. My French is non-existent, so I'm, I'm not yeah. totally <laughs> sure how that goes. And this was just like, I looked at this and I Googled it, I Googled something along the lines of, is this real or is this exaggerated? Or And then I looked you up because I was like, is this one of those, like, what what's going on here? This can't be a big thing because this is the first I'm hearing about it. I'm reasonably well-informed, you know, and why is this the only thing? There's not a whole lot of websites about this. There just wasn't much. But if you look up every other problem in the world, there's, like, whole organizations and there's cha- foundations and there's all kinds of stuff going on. There's dedicated government agencies to things like this, and there just isn't. A- and it, you had mentioned, I think, in the book or or possibly in the documentary that there was a 5,000% increase in child rape videos on the Internet, which, like, even if the amount of videos on the Internet was one and there was a 5,000% increase, that's a ton of it, you know? And the, and I'm, I'm pretty sure we're not talking about one that multiplied right that way. This is This is like a massive massive amount of and like where where is this happening is it happen? it's obviously happening all over the world i assume it happens plenty in the united states if our demand is so high our production also has to be reasonably high our production is high for sure and the scary thing about about what about this crime is there's no stereotype you you, you can't profile someone it's it's anyone it's everyone it's like this closet crime uh, we've arrested professionals, medical professionals, lawyers, educators, law enforcement officers. Jeez. I mean, a handful. Of, I've had to arrest a handful of law enforcement officers in my life who were into this, um, and it's it's that's what's so devastating about it. It's so hard to identify. It's it's dark. A lot of it's on the dark net. We we build labs. Our foundation builds labs in different countries, mobile labs as well, um, be, to help get the tools into the hands of law enforcement so they can find this. Um, this is why, I, like I said, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children just came out just a few weeks ago and said uh, two million excess child abuse reports in, in in March, four million in excess of 2019, March 2020, uh, because it's all online. And that's in the United States, it is. If you go overseas into developing countries, you're going to find it more on the street corners, on the beaches, in certain certain districts. But here in this country, in our in the United States, it is online, which means every child is vulnerable that has internet access, mm-hmm. and every pedophile that has that same access has a weapon to get that child. And that's that's the reality. I remember when I was really young, my probably like eleven. 
my fr- family friend, they got a computer. The guy was like a big computer guy, worked on computers for Ford or something like that. And they had a modem, which now is nobody even knows what that is now. But it basically <laughs> meant you could connect your computer to Prodigy or America Online or, or the, inter- the proto-internet uh, that people were using back then. And I remember that we weren't allowed to use that computer without – it was locked up. And we were like, why? And the guy told – our family friend told my parents, you'd be surprised – there are pedophiles on there. And my parents were like, what? How can that be the case? And his kids weren't allowed to use it. I mean, this is like 1990, 1991. So it's almost like as soon as the internet was available, these guys were on top of it for criminal activity of this variety. This was like the first kind of crime that I'd even heard about online. Yeah, you get bank wire fraud and stuff like that. It's pretty specialized. But this was kind of like the first street crime level crime if you will crime that was even being done online from what i understand absolutely and it's because of the nature of it because who these people are they have everything to lose Mm -hmm. i mean it's it's actually a high suicide rate for those who we arrest because they've lost everything right so they have to commit their crimes in secret and the internet provided that for them and the dark net even better because now they really feel anonymous and they can and they can do their their dirty work uh in in the dark uh, but when kids disappear, when kids get kidnapped and they're, and they dis- every time when we find a kid, every time there's this long trail of, uh, contact with, with their, with their predator online, that's where it started. And they'll come in, they'll come in, you know, un- undercover, they'll come in wanting to befriend your child on, inst- on, on, on Facebook or follow them on Instagram. And they have a false eye- picture. They have a picture that looks like. You know, he's, he's the kid in the high school next door mm-hmm. and oh my gosh, I'm, and they're flattered and it's a slow, slow, slowly by slowly, they kind of lure them in and then they find out where they are and they grab them. I mean, it is, parents need to wake up to what's going on. So this is like, starts off as somebody chatting with underage kids. God, this is so creepy to me because I remember when I was in high school talking, uh, I was always on America Online. I was like a big computer internet kid back then. And I remember female friends of mine being like, oh, I'm going to go meet this guy. Will you come with me? Because it might be dangerous. And there was a time we showed up outside of the movie theater where I actually worked. So I was like, hey, if it's creepy, we can just run in there. And I know the manager and I work there and I can use my, you know, whatever to get in like the back door. If it's just thinking if he's like a like a guy we just want to ditch dude we showed up and it wasn't a 17 year old guy it was like a like a 50 year old man exactly. and she was talking with him and he was like uh hey is that your boyfriend and he was so creepy and then finally he was like if you tell your friend to go away i'll give you 50 dollars if you watch me you know figure out the rest and i was just we, she's like oh my god no so we ran away and then went through the, the movie theater and it just we thought that was a weird occurrence but there's like a non-zero chance that if I wasn't there, that that girl would have just gotten nabbed by that guy. Gone. That He'd be gone. Exactly. And what you just described, Jordan, is happening every day. All Just two weeks ago, 40 miles from my home. And, and you can look at this up. You can, you can Google the news story. A guy named Danny Hardman uh, was arrested, 42 years old. He was grooming online two six-year-old girls. Online gaming is, they love that. They go on and play the little kids games on the online gaming um, and on also, also through Facebook. He had convinced these two six-year-old girls to get, take their clothes off and take sexually exploita- ex- exploitative pictures of themselves and send to him. And luckily the AG's office intervened and, and nabbed the guy, but he was on his way, you know, to, to the next step. I mean, this is happening everywhere and it's constant. So scary because I have a 10 month old son and we're, you know, people say, hey, don't get him too much screen time, even if it's cartoons. But of course, when your kid's eight and he's like, mom, let me see the iPad. I want to play Candy Crush. You're not thinking, oh, there's pedophiles on the chat system that they don't have in Candy Crush. But how would we even know? Like as a parent, you can't even look at the app and go, hey, hold on. Is there a way for people to chat with you? Show me where that is. Okay, they might not. Your kid might not even know. It's exactly right. And it's it's the scary thing because parents have been through a lot of things they can teach their kids. Yeah. You know, they 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 learn how to drive a car. They learn how to be they've been bullied on the playground. They, you know, dating things. Parents are like, I've been there, let me teach you this. But most parents, a lot of parents, uh, at least in my generation and up, 
they didn't have any experience in this. They didn't. They don't know what online gaming is. Yeah. And like you said, they have no. They give their kid a game. They have no idea that there's 50 people watching your kid play a game, and then pretending to be a kid too. And that's what the, that's what happens here. And then slowly but surely, they know how to get into your, your kid's head and start getting them to do things they 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 didn't mean to do. And that's 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 what we're dealing with. I, I was interviewing somebody reasonably well known, like uh, uh, on this show, and I said, "Hey, there's a, some noise in the background." He goes, "Oh, my kids are playing Xbox," and I go, "Oh, wow," because they're yelling and screaming, they're really loud. And I said, "Because you just play with his friends," and he we, he paused and goes, "You know, I don't know. There's just a bunch of kids on there playing," and I thought nothing of it. But now I'm like, "We don't know those are kids <laughs> exactly. playing Xbox with your kid." Exactly. Your child. And, and of course, they're on quarantine, whatever, right now, lockdown. So they're in there all the time. That Because I, I was so con confused. Like, how can U.S. kids get sucked into this? They have parents that care about them. They've got teachers. They have Most people have infrastructure. Granted, there are plenty of kids that have crap parents and no social infrastructure. I would imagine those people are even more vulnerable to this kind of thing. They absolutely are. Uh, the infrastructure keeps them safe. I mean, I, I we work in countries like Haiti, you saw in, yeah. in, in the documentary. Well, why are those kids so vulnerable? Because there's no infrastructure. There's the infrastructure that would keep them safe doesn't exist. And we threw our kids during during this lockdown period into something similar. You know, even though our, our we have homes and we we have a, a, you know a, a prosperity in some ways, in many ways, that infrastructure is what's keeping them safe. Um, another form of trafficking I want to mention where we find it in the most affluent areas. Uh, it's, it's, it's a form people don't recognize, but a, a teenage girl, we see thousands of these cases with a boy and they end up you know, having sex or doing whatever and they film it or he films it. Then they break up as teenagers do quickly. And then that kid, the ex-boyfriend, starts basically trafficking the girl saying, look, I have your email list. I will send this to your, to your school, to your pastor, to your parents, unless you go have sex with that guy, my friend, and do this. Mm -hmm. Or You wouldn't believe how many cases like that happen. And, the, and these, these, these girls are freaked out. They think their life's over. And so now they're being trafficked, even though they're going home every night in their, in their nice big houses with their security and their security dogs and their big gates. And they are being trafficked right under the nose of their parents. And their parents are shocked. Oh, so it, it's, it, this is something that's another trend that's, that's growing. You know, it's funny you should mention this. I've watched a TED Talk from somebody who grew up in an affluent area and she had this exact same scenario play out. I can't remember her name. And I Googled her, and she had gone to my high school in Michigan, which was around all of these other sort of, like, gated community-type kids. Like, our parking lot, aside from my Ford Tempo GL, looked like a Mercedes-Benz dealership because everybody had money. So I was like, how could that have happened in our area? And sure enough, you know, I Googled more of her talks and she's like, I was going to Bloomfield Hills and West Blue. And I'm like, these are areas where judges live, where people who own, like the guy who owns an auto supplier, you know, the whole board lives in this area and it's happening right in there, which is, these are, these are 0.1 percenters, some of these people, you know, this is like, this crime is not just kids who grew up in a hellish ghetto area being abused by other people who live in that area. This is like a truly global, knows no boundaries type of criminal enterprise. It absolutely is. And, you know, the, 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 these traffickers, they're experts at rewiring the brains of kids, which is what allows them confidence. The traffickers have confidence that go, go ahead and go home. I still got you. Mm -hmm. I still, I still got you. You know, you can go home, you can sleep in your bed, you can have dinner with your parents every night, but I still, I still got you. And when we go through the rehabilitation phase of our mission, that's when we really learn the damage that's internal, that's inside, that's in the brain and, and rewiring that and, and, um, you know, rolling that all back. It is so complex and so difficult. Uh, it's best that it never happens in the first place. And it's just, we don't have the awareness campaign that we need. It, the aftercare seems to be a big part of your rescues and your programs because, uh, I mean, you can't just be like, all right, we got you out of the fake orphanage. Like, good luck. Go stay in school. Like, what are you going to do? You can't do that. Right. You know? Right. Right. Most of these kids don't have parents. Uh, that's how they got taken in the first place. Not all of them, but there's a big number of them that, that that's how they were taken. So we partner with aftercare uh homes all throughout the world. Uh, in fact, when a law enforcement agency comes to us and says, we'd like you to help consult with us and provide us the tools, our first question is, okay, if we do that, 
where are the kids going to go that, that we help you rescue? Oh, they're going to go to our state run. No, we don't do state run anything. <laughs> I've learned I've learned my lesson on that one. But we go out and find the partners that we trust. They're generally other NGOs, private organizations, and we find them, we vet them, and and then we give them resources as needed. Once we feel that we're ready, then we go back to the law enforcement agency and say, now we can begin. But you have to sign this MOU stating that any kids rescued have to go to one of our vetted institutions. And then we stay with those institutions. We stay with those kids. We rescued, a, we had a, did a big hit operation in 2014. Um, in fact, there's a move, there's a feature film that, that is coming out this year about this operation. Mm -hmm. It's called The Sound of Freedom, stars Jim Caviezel, Mira Servino, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and it comes out this year, just finished, um, uh, that tells the story of this huge um, operation we did, the largest bust ever. Uh, we rescued 121 uh, victims wow. and 15 traffickers went down. Uh, and, Where was uh, that? It was in Colombia. Oh man! And so these little kids, we we had a hundred. I mean, hundred and twenty victims. A lot of them children, little children. Uh, some of them are just now been through our programs, and now they're graduating. And just to show you how important aftercare is for us, we stay with them. So some of these children that we rescued, that were you know twelve, thirteen, they're they're now becoming adults, and they're through our aftercare program, and we're we're still with them. You know, we are still. Um, we're still uh, helping them get into college, giving them scholarships, helping them start businesses. Um, but that's that's what we do to 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 the point of aftercare. We stay with these kids forever, even into adulthood. We're still staying with them. What do you guys need? How can we help you? You had mentioned that you you just said something that I think a lot of people are like, wait, what? You said that that I rescued my own children. Yeah, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to fill that in, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. One of the reasons we started Operation Underground Railroad, I was a special agent loving my job, and I learned about this little boy in that was kidnapped in Haiti. He was a U.S. citizen. That's how I learned about the case. But of Haitian descent, he moves to Haiti back with his family. His father's the pastor of this church, and the little boy's kidnapped from the parking lot one Sunday afternoon after church. And I think we can make this a U.S. case, um, but it wasn't a U.S. case. At the same time, so I, I so I, I'm so I become obsessed with this story. Mm -hmm. Because I know that very little is going to be done in a country like Haiti. It, has, it doesn't have the resources. So I bring the father to my office, and I sit down with him, and I, I start talking to him about um, what's being done to find his son. And he says to me, he shocks me with a question. He says, do you have children? I said, yes. He said, could you sleep at night knowing that one of your children's beds was empty? And I just start, I just start weeping. Yeah. And I'm just like, no. And he said, well, to Ugh. answer the question, what's being done to find my son? Because I can't sleep at night. And because law enforcement in my country is doing nothing for me, I arbitrarily pick some neighborhood. The darker, the better. The more crime ridden, the better. Arbitrarily pick some neighborhood and walk the streets, flashlight in hand. And I pray to God that I'll just hear my son cry. And I'm just going, first of all, I'm emotionally just sunk. Yeah. But also going, there's stuff we can do, bro. Like, you, you, there's investigative techniques. So I become obsessed, and I promise the father, I will never stop until he finds your son. Wow. Uh, thinking I can do it under, under the jurisdiction of the U.S. government, with my badge, with my resources of the U.S. government. But that promise was real to me. And, and so I start working the case, and I find out, hey, Tim, back off. You can't do any. This is a Haitian crime. It's a Haitian case. Get out. But why? Uh, this, why though? Is he's an American citizen, a kid, right? Well, because it was because it was it was interpreted by the powers that be, not my office, or even, not even yeah. my department. Um, my 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 office wanted me to go as, as push it as far as I could go, uh, but ultimately it was decided. Look, it was it was done by Haitians. Uh, the, the 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 Haitian government says they're on it, and. That was the, the imperative. That was the instruction given to me. Uh, at the same time, I had done something similar in Colombia, which led to that other hit. Uh, I, I'd, got, I'd gone down there to consult on a case, very limited you know, mandate, but I put myself undercover and I went way beyond what I was allowed to do, which then broke open this huge case. So here we are grappling with this. It's about 2013. My, my wife and I, and I'm like, look, in both cases, I was told, come home, get out of this. You can't do this. This is not, there's no mandate. This isn't going to end in a U.S. courtroom. 
um, you know, we don't have, you know, Congress would light us up basically if you stayed down here. Yeah. Um, and it was those two cases that basically compelled us to say, look, we're going to go for this. I don't know if I can feed my, I had six kids at the time. And I, I, I said, wow. I don't know in six months if we'll have any money, honestly, to pay the rent, to pay the mortgage. Uh, but we just knew we had to do it. So off we went. And on the Haiti case, we went in and we worked with the police. Once we came in with resources, they were willing to cooperate with us. And they did. And we found the captors of the little boy. We found the people that kidnapped him. And what's, what scared the heck out of us was that where where the evidence led us to, where they were, was a compound with 28 children. We flew a drone over, overhead and counted 28 children, but it wasn't a registered orphanage. The sign outside said orphanage. So we're thinking, oh my gosh, we, oh, this is a trafficking center. That's this is so an undercover, creepy. So creepy. And then we come to find out this is what happens, in, especially in developing countries like Haiti. After that earthquake in 2010 or after the hurricanes that go through, it's harvest time for the traffickers. I mean, that earthquake killed... About a quarter million people instantly. But what the media didn't talk about was the half a million or more orphans that were made instantly. And these kids are walking the streets, blood, sweat, just terror, horror everywhere. And, and, the, and the traffickers come into the country posing as aid workers, posing as orphanages. They throw orphanage signs over the side of a wall. And now innocent people are shepherding these children oh, into man. what they think is Ugh. right. They're co-opting so, people's goodwill and they're getting exactly. them to bring kids in. Like, this is my third nephew once removed. Please take care of him. And he gets exactly. freaking sold. Oh, it's so disgusting. And so two of those kids, a one and a two-year-old, were ushered in to this place that said orphanage. So we're, we're with the police and we identify what is a front. We recognize that it's a front for, a, you know, it's, it's not an orphanage because it's not registered, but there's 28 children. And so we go in undercover. And uh, what happened to me I had been in situations like this before, but I've never seen 28 children all together in captivity. And I remember standing at the gates of this place, looking in, and I was instructed by the Haitian police to go undercover pretending to be an American trafficker. Uh, and because traffickers, these foreign traffickers are used to dealing with Americans, Westerners. That's, again, that's where the market is, right? So, so I'm, I'm looking at these kids, and I start getting this same thing that I told you about earlier, this, this almost PTSD kind of reaction and I start seeing my own children. And I, I had actually been to therapists that the government supplied for us because our work is so nutty to, to help, help me get around that, help me not s do this anymore. Because if I superimpose my kids' faces, you know, in my mind on these kids, I, 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 I was shutting down. I, yeah. I was driving to my kid's school and taking them out and going home and, and crying my eyes out. But, but I started getting that feeling again. It was interesting at the gate. I remember looking in and I thought to myself, you know what? I'm going to embrace it. I'm not going to fight it. I'm going to embrace it. Uh, and I'm so glad I did. I was ready to embrace it and make these kids my kids. And so I walk into this place because there's nothing you wouldn't do for your, your son, right? Sure. I mean, there's nothing. You'd give your life in, in a second sure. to save his life. And so if, if you look at these kids like they're yours, imagine there's nothing you won't do. And you become a more effective um, agent. You become a more effective uh, operator in the field. And that's what happened on this case. So we went in undercover. And sure enough, these guys approach us and they tell us, look, th these kids are $10,000. They ended up raising the price of 15 by the end of the, of, of the deal. But any of these kids are for sale. He, they had a whole instruction on how to evade police, how to get around, what do you do? And so I'm looking for little Guardy because I, I know he's got to be in here somewhere because all the evidence said he was. Um, but in the meantime, I was instructed by the Haitian police because we always work with police. We're not a rogue unit. We, we work under the jurisdiction of whatever jurisdiction we're in. And they told me, they said, Tim, if they're selling kids, which most likely they are, buy them, accept the deal because we need the evidence. I got mm -hmm. cameras all over my body, right? Hidden. And so we're going to get the evidence. So I'm looking for a kid to buy and I don't think it matters. And I'm looking around and, and in that moment, in fact, you, you, there's a, there's a image of this in the documentary that you saw from the undercover camera um, this little boy turns and walks towards me and, and I just pick him up and I just look at him I'm like, this is the one I'm going to buy in the sting operation. Well, then I find out shortly after that, that he has a sister, this amazing little girl who's been saving his life, by the way. You know, I tried to give her at, at one point I was holding this little boy looking for Guardy, you know, and, and I had one of my colleagues keeping the traffickers busy and there's these dark outbuildings on this compound and I'm going in there so my camera can pick up everything and that's when I get introduced to this little girl. She follows me in here. I'm holding the little boy. 
he's my excuse to kind of get in. I, I get him to kind of point and, you know, and, and so if anyone's watching like, oh, he's just, this kid wants to show him his room or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Where are well, your friends? I get, yeah, exactly. So I get in and this little girl's followed me in and I swing around. I look at her and she's looking at me like me, if death could, if, if looks could kill. Oh yeah. I'm like, I, I loved it. I'm like, who's this brave little girl that's just like, what's up? And so I give her a candy bar. These kids are all starving, by the way. We medically confirm later. I give her a candy bar. And I'm like, take this and, and go away. And I knew something was up when I gave this little kid. Because even my kids, right, who are not starving, they don't, they don't do what she's about to do, right? They take their candy bar. If I need to go on the outside and eat it, Dad, I'm going to, as long as I get it. This little girl takes this, this starving little girl, doesn't take her eyes off me or the little boy, breaks that candy bar in half, Hands the other half into the hands of the little boy. Again, I have experience with kids. Kids don't do that. Yeah, <laughs> that, That's not their muscle memory. This is muscle memory for this kid, this little girl. So then I realized, what have I done? This is the sister. And so I put, him, I put little boy down. She grabs the little boy and pulls him in and just stands between me and him, which I'm just loving. I'm just <laughs> like, I've never seen so much love in action. Like, And, and I kneel down and I, I break the cardinal rule of undercover operations and I tell them who I am. You know, I said, I'm here for you. I'm not, you, you'll never be apart again. So then that leads us to then telling the trafficking, the traffickers, we want to buy both the kids, which increases the price. So, but again, I think it's just a sting operation. Sure. We're just going to use these kids. I just want to keep them together and I'll make sure they get into a good home later, a good aftercare home. So the whole thing blows up and it's, it's beautiful. I mean, the, in a good way, uh, they, they take the bait, they, 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 they sell the kids to us. The cops come in, everyone gets arrested. And, um, but the kicker is the little boy's not there. Guardy's little not Guardy there. Little Guardy is not there. He's been sold already. And I have to go have this conversation with his father who's waiting in another room. I, I'm sorry, in another hotel. Uh, we couldn't bring him too close to the site. Sure. The, the emotional part, aspect. So I then go and I have what I believe to this day still is the most consequential, maybe the most important conversation I've ever had with anybody. I, I have to tell him that his son wasn't there and we have no idea where he was. If you knew the hope that we had leading up to this... His son was going to be rescued. Yeah. I was going to walk through that hotel. I, and a thousand times I played it in my mind. I'm going to walk through those doors and I'm going to deliver this boy back to his father. And I walk through those doors and I'm empty handed. Mm -hmm. And, and this father, his name's Gesno. He looks at me. I look at him and he just starts to bawl, just weep. And I sit down and, and I'm crying. He's crying. And I eke out the words that we did rescue 28 children. And then this guy does something. He pops his head up, stops crying. And he says, why are we crying? This is amazing. We rescued 28 kids. You know, and I said, guess no, I'm, I'm worried about the one we didn't rescue. Mm -hmm. And he says, no, you're missing the point. He said, if my son hadn't been kidnapped, no response would have come. No one, no teams would have come to rescue these kids. And he said this, he said, if I have to lose my son so that these 28 kids can be rescued, that is a burden I'm willing to bear. Oh. And I'm just... I'm just looking at this guy thinking, who are you? I wish I could say that. Yeah. Even to this day, if we're roles reversed, I know I couldn't. I wish I could. Then I go with him to the police station. He goes, let's go to the police. I want to find out more. So he, we go to the police station and he tells the police, like, I'm, I'm already in awe of this guy, right? And then he says yeah. to them, if you can't find parents for the children who were rescued in the name of my son, then I will take them. I will be their father. Wow. And he goes home with Eight of those 28 kids. And I'm just, I am so in awe. So I, I go home that night in this rat infested Port-au-Prince hotel room because all we could afford at the time. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and I call my wife and I'm like, you won't believe this story. I usually don't give her all the details because I don't want to yeah. you know, scare her. But I, you won't believe, I tell this story and, and I just kept saying, I want to be like this guy. This guy's my hero. Can you imagine, if faced with this, he goes to the light. He goes to how can I help? Um, these kids who were rescued in the name of my son. I'm just, I'm weeping on the phone. And my wife, who is my spiritual guide and my, you know, I, sh she's the one who gets me into all these good things. Um, <laughs> you, you get and, yourself and, into trouble. She gets you into the, <laughs> into the other That's side right. That's right. And, and she says to me, if you want to be like him, let's be like him. He took eight. You told me the story about these two beautiful children. And she says to me, I want to be their mother. If he can take eight, I can take two. And I said, you got to be kidding me. You already had we six just, kids, just so everyone knows. We had six knows. kids. I had just left my job. I had no money. I mean, I, I, I lost my pension when I quit early. 
and you know, we're running a nonprofit in the beginning days, especially. I mean, we're we had we had nothing. You know, yeah. it's just like we had enough money to do this operation. And I'm like, hun, this is expensive. Like, she's like, I don't care. It's like, it's you do the right thing, and and do the right thing, and the other things will take care of themselves. <sighs> so we we did it, Jordan. So I, I under the instruction of of my wife, I went back and I said, and, and I'll take these. I want these two children, and. And they've been home now for two years. It took us three years to go through the adoption process, but they are home. They've been home for two years. They're thriving. They're beautiful kids. And this little girl who 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 rescued, who protected her little brother, I learned more about her story, and and she becomes my hero. You know, I, I she does way more for me than I'm doing for her. Um, you know, because I, I went to her and I, we, she's now they're now in a good orphanage for the three years it takes to get them home. And every time we go down and bring toys and supplies, this little girl can't keep a thing for herself. Just like with the candy bar, right? She's giving everything away, everything. And and I come to find out what's going on. You, when you have a life of service, your body actually res- responds with a chemical reaction when you're giving of yourself. And you, it's a it's this beautiful thing that happens with with um, dopamine and serotonin and oxytocin. Mm-hmm. And, and 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 all of a sudden you're you're a happier person. We all experience this, you know. You when you're giving and serving, you're happier. Um, you're optimistic. You're full. You're full of light and creativity. And it's like that's your your daughter found that she needed a way to protect her little brother. She was living in a world where she was enslaved. I mean, the only adults in her life wanted to hurt her in the worst ways. Yeah. And and how she got around it was serving, serving her little brother, serving the other kids in the orphanage. That's what I was witnessing. And I thought, what a lesson for for all of us. Uh, and and I mean, she protected her little brother through just serving and serving and serving and becoming empowered against darkness. So um, anyway, these kids are mine now. They're, 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 they're thriving. But the, the, it was the only case, I want to mention this, that I worked in my life that was a preventative strike. So my kids were never sexually exploited. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't even probably be telling the story. Sure. Um, it was one of the few times because we were following Gardy into, we, we really were able, usually you can't get that close until someone's already, the transaction's been made. Okay. You know, and then it's too late. Usually it's it's the lead that comes after the abuse. But in this case, because we were following a little boy who was kidnapped, we got into the belly of the beast early. And so we those 28 kids were rescued before they were sold to pedophiles. Um and so it's 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 an amazing story and uh, it's blessed our lives tremendously. What happens to those people who get arrested? I mean, what do you do cuz Haiti's a little bit they got a lot of fish to fry. I wouldn't say bigger fish to fry, but they got a lot of f- they got a lot of issues they're dealing yes. with. We do too, yes. but like there's a special place in hell for any child trafficker. I just wonder if Haiti sort of has that same thing where they're like, okay, we're these people, we're burning them up to their neck in the sand. So it's not where I want it to be for sure. In, in fact, most people say, you're crazy to work in Haiti. How can you work there? Because that, that's so corrupt. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we've had cases in the documentary, for example, you saw the case where we, we arrested um, nine traffickers and they all, within a week, they were selling little children, raping 10-year-old kids, filming it. And we had all the evidence on, on video. And notwithstanding, they paid their way out of jail. Um, and, and in that case, we actually got to the president of Haiti somehow through a congresswoman, a, a U.S. congressman of Haitian descent, Mia Love, got us into his office. And we just, she ripped him up. She's like, you cannot let this. And so he, he issued arrest warrants. We went back and got the bad guys. But so you Haiti arrested is, them, put them in jail. They paid their way out. They got back into the business. You went and got a congresswoman, got into the president's office who issued arrest warrants. Then you went and got the same people again? Yes. Crazy, oh. cra- a crazy story. But that's that's what happens when you work in a place like Haiti. Um, most people say don't work there uh, because of that. But we just said we can't. I mean, I, my heart is there now. We're still yeah. looking for the little boy. We haven't found him yet. We think we'll find him. We, we believe we'll find him. We have we have leads. My children are from there. So, my, I mean, my heart is in Haiti. And I, I just said, look, we're going to fight. We'll fight the corruption. We'll fight the traffickers, but we're not leaving. And so it's 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 a unique it's a unique situation in Haiti. Yeah, you you can't just go. Ah, it's really hard here. I mean, the reason the problem is so severe there is because it's hard to enforce the laws. You can't exactly. Just, what are you gonna do? It's like um, you can't just move the goalposts to where it's easy and then think you're solving the problem. That makes no sense. It's exactly right. Before we before our big hit on that on on that um, operation that we're t- talking about where the corruption came in, I actually wimped out. I told Gesno, the father of the little boy, because. 
you know, everywhere we go looking for the little boy, we end up rescuing more kids. Sure. We've rescued a hundred kids looking for the little boy <laughs> and taken, we've taken down, I, I think close to 50 traffickers looking for this little boy. And so I remember right before this hit, these traffickers were high end. And I said, guess no, I don't know if we should do this. I mean, this is going to blow back. These guys are going to buy their way out of jail. I know yeah. that. And, and it's going to come back on us and our foundation. And he says, Tim, if you give up right now, you're giving up on Guardy. And I'm like, okay, enough said, <laughs> let's, let's do it. And then he says to me, he says, and I have a contingency plan in, in case that happens. And, uh, and he tells me the contingency plan. And I say, guess no, if I ever have to do that, like that is the, that's the, 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 the most dangerous, ridiculous thing I, would, I, I, would, I will have ever done in my life. Within a week of the arrest, I'm in, I'm in Washington, D.C. I get a phone call on my private cell phone that I gave nobody. Right. And the criminals are calling me. Wow. And they're, they're, and they're death, it's a death threat to me. And I, and I knew instantly, okay, there's only one way they could get my phone number. Only the officials of Haiti, a couple of them had my phone number. Mm -hmm. So I knew it had happened. I called Gesno. He says, I know, I know it's happening. Let's, let's do the contingency plan. Now, the contingency plan was, you have all the video, Tim. So we'll go into Port-au-Prince, into the belly of the beast. We'll invite all the media and we'll expose the truth. And <laughs> and uh, because they don't realize we filmed everything because it's all hidden cameras, oh, right? Oh, right. We, have, think, we yeah. have everything filmed. So the judges that were corrupt made up a false story about what happened and made that the official record. Well, we have the video. And, and so the Rotary Club of Port-au-Prince said, we'll host the event. We can promise you safe passage to the event. But once you expose, yeah. we don't know how high up this goes. Mm -hmm. it, it could go so high up that you're never going to leave the country alive. And that was that why it was so crazy. So, And then it gets worse. The stakes, the stakes increase when they say to me, okay, the, the Rotary Club comes back to me and they say, look, no media will come unless you bring a, a famous Haitian, someone they consider famous. I said, oh, who's that? You get like and, Shaggy or something? <laughs> right, exactly. It's like, who's, who do you want me to bring? And they, they give me this um, list and number one on the list is Congress U.S. Congresswoman Mia Love. She's of she's of Haitian descent, and 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 I thought they were joking or they knew something because at the t at the time I didn't know any Congresswoman people except for my own, like the one that is represents me, who lives a few blocks from my house, mm -hmm. and it happens to be Mia Love, <laughs> believe it or not. And so I, I said, oh, I said you must know that I know her, right? No, we did. We just she's just the name that the media gave wow. amongst a couple of names. And so I call Mia Love and I say, Mia, listen, as a friend, I'm going to ask you to say no to this request. <laughs> as, as, as the CEO of Operation Underground Railroad, I'm, I'm still asking you to do it. And I told her this, I said, I need you to come down and just bust these guys out with me. I, and I said, honestly, we could die. Like we could literally be ambushed on the way this, out. It's like a Jim Jones thing where they killed that congressman. You remember that? Yes. You ever hearing about yes, that? Yes, that's right. So, so we're, we're sitting there and we, we do it and she stands up brave and she speaks fluent Creole, Haitian sure. Creole. So she's just killing it. And then I see this guy in the back. We have our security. We're all watching. There's a guy shifty in the back. So we're walking out of the parking lot. We're scared to death. We're like, okay, well now what? And this guy approaches us and he says, I work at, at the presidential palace. W would you please come see the president tomorrow? Wow. And so we're like, okay, what do we do? This could be a setup. Set up, it yeah. could be it could be the presidential palace and we're gonna be hung. Like <laughs> Oh yeah. It could I mean, be a setup and be the president. Yeah. Who knows? Right. It could be oh, it could be anything. So we we decide to go for it. And Mia is so brave. She's braver than me. She's like, I don't care, let's do this. So we, we end up going to the president's office, and sure enough, it, luckily it was it was everything we hoped. And he was he couldn't believe what had happened because it went viral on the news instantly, everywhere. Sure. And and that's when he's that's when he re issued the arrest warrants. And then, and people can watch the the full. If you, you go to Operation Two Saint Amazon Prime, uh, they don't we'll get link into it in the that show notes part. Yeah, we'll link it. But yeah, the, the the story is told there about then what happens, how we go after these guys, and, and what happens. But it's uh, it, it was it was crazy. But that's 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 what it that's what it's like working in a country like Haiti. You know, that's what you got to do. <laughs> you got yeah, you got to just shine light on everything and blow everybody up. Otherwise, they could. It's probably just easier for them consequences wise to sweep it under the rug and be like look i got all kinds of things going on i don't need to put a target on my own back from that's right because these guys are wealthy this isn't like they're not selling like base bathtub meth this is like if this is that big of a multi-million dollar business the corruption goes all the way up as high as as high as anybody will let it go oh yeah though no, they're they're selling child rape the, the child rape videos one of the little the 10 year old girls we rescued I mean, she, she's the subject of child rape material that's being sent to the United States for big dollars. So yeah, it's 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 big it's big money.
I can't imagine the undercover part, right? Because you, if you're pretending to, you're not, you don't just walk around in a Hawaiian shirt and go, hey, is anybody selling any kids? Like, you got to go <laughs> hang out with these dirt bags, right? And, and you got you, you to gotta kill any them. of them. You, you got to go to their home. You got to sit with them. You got to laugh with them. You got to party with them. It's the only way you're going to, you're going to get it. And it is, it, it is devastating. It is so gut wrenching to, to, you know, you look at these guys and they're selling these kids and, and then they bring out their own kids and, and Hey, this is my sweet little daughter. And I'm just like, wait a minute, oh. you're selling, you're selling someone else's kid and, and you're, you're witnessing all this and you're alone in your heart. You're just like, and you got to play along. I mean, I can't tell you how many times oh. you just want to just break cover and just say, you know what? I'm done. I'm I'm going out in glory, like and yeah. you guys are going with me. Like that's what I that's I, I swear to because I'm thinking there's got to be a moment when he introduces his kid and you go like you said you're you're looking at him and you're going wow you're you're not just a merely evil but you're actually able to somehow compartmentalize that your kid and I would yeah I would just be like we're all going yeah pull the pin on we're all going down like I I couldn't believe it I'm surprised you didn't smash any of these guys there is some video i found of you online i guess you're on a boat or something i don't know you're hanging out with these like gross dirt bags and one of the things was like oh what's the youngest girl you've ever and they're laughing and i'm just like how did you not just it's so ugh, hard it's so these hard guys. i mean you learn how to do it over time in the beginning especially it was just so hard you're just like you gotta be kidding me you, you know and i have to laugh i gotta laugh back like right. yeah bro 10 years old you bleepity bleeped her yeah bro like uh, so gross. are you kidding me and then you, you they go away and you go you want to go throw up you're just yeah. you gotta go sit alone in a room for like two hours just to decompress what happened you know what what about these undercover methods because this seems this is kind of non-standard right i mean usually when you think undercover you think okay i'm gonna be a hell's angel and move meth and then bust these guys you, you, this is like a new this is, almost seems like a new kind of operation for for law enforcement Oh, yeah. In fact, it's funny you bring that up. When I got sent to undercover school in the early 2000s, I, they sent me to learn how to infiltrate child trafficking rings. And this is one of the top undercover schools in the nation. Mm -hmm. And to kind of start off, they put me into this room. It's a two-way mirror. And I'm going up against one of the top undercover operators in the U.S. government. And he doesn't know what my story is. Everyone has a different story. Some people are there for drug investigations. Some are there for, for gang violence, whatever. Well, I, and they say, you got to go tell, he doesn't know what I'm going to say, this, 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 this role player uh, agent, but I'm supposed to get him to sell me a child. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I'm tripping all over myself. I'm freaking out. I'm like, how do I do this? How do I bring this up? And there's, there's cameras all over. Cause they're going to analyze and criticize the he heck out of me, you know, afterwards. Sure. And, game I, and I bring, right. And I bring up this, I bring up this uh, topic with the guy we get like three minutes into this, the discussion and he's, she's turning, he's turning like gray and he stands up and he's like out of roll. And he says, guys, I got a, I, I've, he, he looks through the two way mirror at his colleagues. He's like, I've, I've got a, I've got a 10 month old daughter. Like I can't ha do this. And he walks off Ugh. and I'm just going, what, you what's broke going the, on? You broke the inter or the, uh, the trainer. <laughs> yeah. And, and then the, the instructor came in and says, Tim, look, look, I'll be honest. We're, 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 we're pioneering this right now. Uh -huh. Like there's very little curriculum. There's very little anything. We got to figure this out. This is early 2000s when, again, you could Google trafficking and nothing came up, right? Um, and that's why, you know, that's why I turned to history because I thought, okay, if I don't have a curriculum, what do I have? I have history. I have the original Underground Railroad. I have Harriet Tubman. I have Frederick Douglass. And, then I, and that's when I discovered Harriet Jacobs, who becomes my hero. In the, and that's who I wrote about in Slave Stealers. That's why I got into that history. That's why I turned to them because there was no one else to turn to yeah. when we were kind of breaking ground on how to do these investigations. So, so yes, to your point, it's a whole new game. Learning, so we have to teach ourselves to be pedophiles. Can you imagine that? Oh. Or a purveyor of child sex or a trafficker. And it is, it, it, I mean, most guys don't last more than a couple of years and they're like, you're out. I mean, they send us to shrinks immediately. Like every year we got to check in. And I mean, it's, it's because it's, it, it messes with your, your entire soul. You yeah, because you have to dig a compartment in your brain or your soul or your heart or whatever you want to call it, where none of this stuff affects you. But normal people who don't like, I don't have that compartment, and it's got to go somewhere, right? Right. This is non scientific psychology here, obviously. But like, yeah, <laughs> you if you're creating a little like jail cell in your psyche for the worst sh shit that you can ever think about in your entire life. You, you, that thing has to stay watertight. That's toxic waste in there. If that leaks out, you're you're gonna get screwed up. That's then right. It's gonna mess Absolutely. up something else. I mean, well, one of the one of the worst ones I had happened to me. 
was I was going undercover. This was when I was an agent. And this this scene's depicted in the film Sound of Freedom, which which I'll send you so you can look you can yeah. watch this. Caviezel does an amazing job depicting what happened, but it was he true. Was the, it, wasn't he Jesus and Passion of the Christ? Is he's, that what he's, he's from? He's Jesus and okay. Mel Gibson's Passion. He's he's um, Count of Monte Cristo. Oh yeah, he's a, he, he's, he's a Edmond Dantes. I, I asked, I selected him. I asked for him. To oh, you be did one because I love that. I love Count of Monte Cristo so much. It's one of my favorite movies. So that's how we got him to to play the role. That's why I asked, and he he came in and did a fabulous job. Um, but there's there's this scene that's a, depicting a, a real thing that happened where you know when I'm undercover, I, at least I get an undercover. I had undercover passports, and a, you know my name was Brian Black for a while. I had different names, but I had pass. You could hide behind that, and that helped you build that little compartment mm -hmm. because you're like, no, I'm I'm this. Well, I was I was working a case. This guy had over a million pieces of child rape videos and and horrible, and he had connections all through the world, and he wouldn't talk. He wouldn't break. And he was just, just defiant, but he hadn't lawyered up yet. So I could still talk to him. Mm. And so what I, what I did was, uh, I asked that he not be, I asked that he not go to jail right away because we had him dead to rights. And then I went undercover as myself because he had written all this literature talking about how everybody in their heart, in their heart is a pedophile, but this puritanical society of America crushes men's true desires. Oh God, that's and weird. It's so weird. He'd, ri he'd written books. I'd bought all his books. I read everything prior to the investigation, luckily. So I knew everything about his, his psyche. And so I decided to go for it. And I said, look, I, I told my, I told my, my, my colleague to leave the room. Oh. I, went by, I went by myself. I'm wired up. I'm all, it's all recorded. And I said, listen, bro, can you help me? Because I read your stuff. And imagine, you're right, by the way. You're right about men's true desires. And I've got to look at this stuff all day long, and I can't even talk to him about it. And I'm like, seriously, Jordan, I, I, am, I am throwing up in my mouth. Yeah. Because now I'm undercover, going undercover as Tim Ballard, pedophile. Right. I couldn't, I couldn't hide behind the facade that I've created. Right. I had to be myself. And oh. for two weeks, I had to pretend to be a pedophile. And this guy bought it. I mean, he bought it, I don't know how, but he wanted to believe so badly that what he was teaching was true. And I became his convert. And he, and so for two weeks, I was messing with this guy and, and having to go into his house and have, and, you know, hang out with him while I got all the intel I needed. And he's thinking, oh, look, I got one of the cops. I'm so good at this. I'm yes. totally right about this. Even the guy interrogating me is now a fan of my work. What a yes. freaking narcissistic creep, man. That's exactly what happened. And he, he, he felt, he fell for it. We ended up, finally, it ended after a couple of weeks where I got to be, I was in this coffee shop. Again, the film depicts it perfectly what happens. And I get the final information I need from him. And, and then finally the cops come in, take him down. And I, I kid you not, as he's getting taken down, he's saying, run, Tim, run. Oh, no. <laughs> I'll, I'll take it. You just get out of here. He has no idea. I'm, I'm, I'm the two feet right at his face yeah. as he's on the ground screaming for me to run. And I'm just like, oh, look up. Look up, baby. Just yeah. look up. Turn your head and, three degrees yeah, north. Turn, yeah, just turn up. And there I am just looking at him. And he's just shocked. Yeah, and, and and he says, I, he's like, I trusted you. Oh I yeah, like you. all those kids trusted you, you pos. Exactly. Come and, on. And I, I just, I just cussed at him. I couldn't do anything else at that moment. But Caviezel actually made up a line in the movie where, when he looks up and says, I trusted you, and and Caviezel, he says, never trust a pedophile. <laughs> <laughs> and, and 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 off and off he goes to jail. But I'll, <sighs> I'll get you a link. I want you to see the film. I definitely. We'll, we'll get you the link today. So <laughs> I definitely want to want to see it. I, I mean. It's just got to, the whole thing shakes me as a new father, because um, you, you're, I don't know if, if this is something that everybody does, but I, like you, cannot, I can't but help imagine my kids in these situations. I didn't really mention a lot of this stuff to my wife, because she's already got it stressful enough as a mom of a 10-month-old that I don't even want her, like, thinking about these types of possibilities beyond the, the amount that gets her to be slightly more cautious, because otherwise a kid will never get to leave the house. Um, but your organization, Operation Underground Railroad, now in, is it 22 countries? We're 26. We're in 26, 26 countries. Okay, yeah, my info is a little about, out of date. About, about 35% of our operations we do here in the United States. Oh, that's And, and that, number's, so that number's increasing. Yeah, it's, it's bad here. It is bad. And we are finding the jurisdictions that don't have the resources. So a lot of our work is right here. Are you finding that it's happening in, well, actually, we kind of covered this. You said it happens in affluent areas, but I can't imagine that, like, this area of Michigan where I'm from, where they have literally, I'm not even kidding, they have a Ferrari police pursuit vehicle 
which must have caused, well, they probably seized it from a drug dealer. But like this, this area has resources. It's, it's tempting to think, oh, this must happen in like poor southern rural Alabama more than it happens in Manhattan. But that's not really true, is it? It's not true. In fact, I, I was in Michigan not long ago. Um, Genesee County uh, Sheriff, his name's Chris Swanson. Uh, go look him up. Um, he he actually made quite a, he he made some news recently. He went viral just recently. He um, because he, how he was supporting the protests. Oh, that's him, and, the guy who says Chris, I want to walk with you. That guy. Yeah, walk with us. Walk yeah. with us. That's Chris. He's a good, good friend of mine. He, he's been on operations with us. He he's he, he was the, made the sheriff last year. But go look what he's been doing. Um, he he kind of came to us, learned from us. We kind of trained him on how to do these cases, and he has dozens and dozens of pedophiles he's taken down. And what he, what he did was he, he'd, he'd lay the traps in some of the affluent areas, but put, but put the victims in Flint and other areas. Yeah. And these affluent people would travel to Flint to, 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 to rape children and then they'd get caught. But look, look him up and you can learn all about what's happening right in, in Michigan. He's kind of leading the charge right now in fighting this in Flint, Mich in, in, in Genesee County. That's good. Yeah. That's a County, I believe adjacent to where I grew up as well. There, there's gotta just be obviously you can't work undercover anymore because you're right. I, mean, the, I gave I gave I gave that up. Yeah, I yeah, gave that up. <laughs> this kind of thing sort of sort of takes that out. Do you, I had my I had my fill though, so I'm, I <laughs> I can imagine I, I, <laughs> that you have. Yeah, is this a problem that we can actually solve? Because it sounds so pervasive and so few people know about it, and it's so massive that it almost it, it's almost like. Where do you even start to contain this international thing? It's like terrorism. I agree. It is so hard because, you know, we love, we, we've rescued over 4,000 victims in, in our first six years, which I never thought, I mean, I look at that number, I just, I'm so grateful. You know, uh, 2,000 people arrested on our, uh, since we started in 2014. But then you look at the numbers and you're like, you, it's easy to get cynical. Sure. It, it, it's, it's worth it for one. I mean, I would do all this if we just rescued one. It would be worth it. But you get cynical when you look at the statistics because it seems like a drop in the bucket. And the answer to your question is, yes, we can. And here's how we do it. So we went to Columbia when we did that first hit, and we decided to do a demonstration, a, a kind of an experiment. We, we, don't, we didn't have the resources at the time to do this everywhere, but we just wanted to try it. So we just put everything into northern Columbia. Hit after hit, empowered the police. We pull out. They're still hitting. Hit, hit, hit. We build, a, we build a digital forensic lab in Columbia that they're using. All of a sudden, within about, it took about eight months, we could not get anyone who otherwise would introduce you to traffickers or bring you into the market. Like we had shut it down because there's a consequence now. The problem is it, it's so pervasive because where it's happening, there hasn't been a consequence. These traffickers have been working with impunity for decades decades forever mm -hmm. and and now there's a consequence and so we th so our goal then we, th we thought okay fine it works we can shut it down and the same traffickers which we, tr we track them the ones we didn't catch they stopped selling kits now they got into other things they, they were involved in adult prostitution narcotics but at least they're not selling 10 year old girls anymore right, right. because yeah. because we, we made the barrier into that black market way too high. And the travelers, the American travelers didn't travel there anymore because there was a st news stories every month about people getting arrested. So they said, we're not going to go to Columbia to get right. our children. So demand dries up. That's exactly. The key. Exactly. And so, oh, interesting. But, but now, so that became our model. We did that in 2014. So fine. We need to do this everywhere. We're in 26 countries. We need to be in 126 countries, empowering law enforcement and setting up that deterrent everywhere. So travelers stop traveling. Traffickers stop trafficking. We, we believe it's possible. But the problem is right now is I go back again. I love history and mm -hmm. I go to history. How did slavery in its legalized form end in the 19th century? How did it end? Did Abraham Lincoln just raise his hand one day and say, after 400 years of the transatlantic slave trade, I'm going to end this? No. I, I love him. He did, he did what he could do. He did the right thing when he could do it, given the circumstances. But what happened was the people got loud. The abolitionist movement in the 19th century, you know, again, Harriet Tub Tubman, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Beecher Stowe, who, who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin after stumbling upon slavery and saying, what is going on? Lincoln even admitted, he said, you know, when he met Harriet Beecher Stowe for the first time in the White House during the war, he said, so you're the lady that wrote the book that started this war. 
even he recognized that people got so loud that the government had to move. The government had to act. And that's the piece we're missing right now. The, the, the model's been proven. But, but I ha we have to get every country clamoring for that, asking for that, screaming for that solution, and then the resources will be put in place. And that's where I get frustrated. Like, look what's happening right now. Like, I'm not going to get into the argument, the, mm -hmm. the whole debate with the riot. I'm just using it as an example. But governments are shifting now. They're people are getting so loud that they're shifting, and you, you, we're going to see changes. Again, right or wrong, I'm not going to get into that. But I would love to see someday that happen for child rape victims. <laughs> I'd like to see something so loud in every country that we have riots and people screaming because just, that's, what, that's how the abolitionists took care of it in the 19th century. We need to become modern day abolitionists for modern day slavery. And that's why, we hope, that's why we're grateful for, for you, Jordan, and people who were willing to, to talk about it. Because until people get loud, we won't be able to actually implement that model. But once they're loud, the tools are in place and we can end this. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah, no, it does. It, there needs to be like political will, especially if we don't know about it, because there's going to be multiple steps, right? First, people have to know about this. Then they have to be in, which I would imagine it's then a short jump for them to be enraged enough to say, wait a minute, all we need to do is make it tougher for these guys to do this, or we need to just be a little bit more stringent checking parents coming in with kids that their papers are legit, or we need a database internationally that's not something that's subject to corrupt officials entering somebody in for 500 bucks. Like, there's going to have to be something like that, because it's not an impossible pro I would imagine a lot of the kids that are trafficked to the United States are brought over, uh, well, actually, how are they brought in? Are they flown in, or are they trafficked over the desert? Everything. So they, they are flown in, uh, false passports, they, uh, they love that game, or, or legit passports that are then stolen once they get here, and then they're put to work as enslaved labor or sex trafficking. Also, the southern border is, is a major trafficking route um, where they, they can just walk across with, with, with nothing. Um, uh, you know, that, that, and that gets into a, an issue that shouldn't be political, but got politicized about how to, how to, you know, how do you find these kids? I worked for 12 years as an undercover operator on the border. That's where I was stationed in, mm -hmm. in Calexico, California. And um, it's all about moving traffic to get the kids, make the smoke, force them into a port of entry because that's where the operators and officers are trained to identify where children, how, how to, you know, that's how we rescue the kids. Um, but, but when it's just free and open and, and the, the traffickers just at will bring these kids in and once they get in, it's, I mean, we, we helped to rescue a little girl who was smuggled in from Mexico. She walked, smuggled in through a, a, a barrier list part, just through the desert, taken to New York city between the ages of 12 and 17 years old in New York city. This was just in the last eight years. She was raped over 60,000 times. I can't even wrap she, my head around that number. If you, I mean, they, they take this girl, New York city, she's, she's, and she's taking, she, she's now testifying against her, her trafficker. Good. She's got, them, oh all locked, God, she's got them all locked up in Homeland security investigations. <laughs> my former agency is working awesome on that case. But what happens is they bring them here and they just have these clients lined up and they just bring, they put her in a car in the morning and they drive her to this house, this hotel, this bar. And she's raped. I mean, easily 15 to 20 times within a 24 hour period. And she's told you have to go in there. If you're not out in 30 minutes, you're not going to get food. So, you know, finish off this guy in, thir in, in you know, 30 minutes or less or whatever. So it's, I think it's actually 15 minutes. And that's her life. I mean, she's, she's home until the next, I mean, and this is the life of, of thousands, tens of thousands of children in the United States right now. How do you, oh God, how do you, how do you even, I was going to ask if you'd ever rescued anybody who was like 18, 19, 20, who's like, life was that since se six, seven, eight years old. How do you even begin to come out of that? Like, what do you, how do you come out of that? It's so, so hard. You know, when, when we rescue the kids that are younger, they're, they're like, thank you. Then it's this emotional thing. And, and, and hopefully it hasn't gone so far that the, the, the rewiring and the healing doesn't take as long. But to your point of the older people, yes, they are, they're usually in the, in, in the, in the, in the net, you know, when you do a rescue operation, we find them too. And, and they're the ones that I'm most worried about because they're 18 now. They don't have to come to our aftercare home. And they often, you know, Stockholm syndrome is a very real thing. Sure. And they'll, they'll stand by their trafficker, the same guy who kidnapped them when they were 10 years old and has been forcing them to, to, to be raped 
tens of thousands of times through their childhood, but now they're 18, 19, 20, and they're standing by, and we're the bad guys. So that is, it just breaks your heart, and you're like, ah. oh, please, I can't make you come, but please, here's here's our number. This is open to you, and some do, but too often they don't. They become traffickers themselves. Oh, eventually. yeah, I can see that. I, I yeah. almost, I hate to say sympathize, but I can um, I can understand why that would be the thing that would happen to you if you because a decade in the life of somebody who's eighteen years old Absolutely. and it's the only life they know, and now they have to survive and make money and they're completely numb and, and traumatized. I can uh, I not again obviously not excusing that, but I understand why that's the avenue that they choose to take. It's the only business that they know. Absolutely, that's why I am a huge advocate for for not criminalizing prostitution. Really? Um, Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because because if you, the, now I'm I'm not for decriminalizing the sex trade. You know, that's a big debate right now. Even in New York, they're trying mm-hmm. to decriminalize the whole thing, the rights of sex workers, and so forth. Um, I'm not I'm not for that because that just creates child sex hubs. You know, these these traffickers are bad guys. They need to go to jail. I, I, and and some some legislators in this country and others want to decriminalize them, let them be legal pimps because mm-hmm. they're just helping these adult sex workers. But I know I know the truth. I worked I've worked undercover against these guys. They will sell the children too. They just won't tell you about it. So now you're going to legitimize their business, and they'll let you into the adult section of the brothel. But they're never going to take you to the stable downstairs or in the basement or, frankly, spread across 20 hotels in the city where there's 10-year-olds and 11-year-olds who they can sell for double what they're getting for the adult sex workers. So I'm very much a proponent of decriminalizing those prostitutes, those sex workers. They should not because you don't know their past. You don't know their past. You don't know what's going on. But I do not agree with with this current trend of because kids will get hurt like – like I'm all for, you know, I'm libertarian in many ways. So, you know, if you want to mm-hmm. choose to do that, that's your choice. But if that choice creates the opportunity for thousands of children to be raped, no, I'm not going to stand with you on that. Yeah, yeah. And so that's where I land on that. But but it, yeah, it's it's a debate going on in the nation right now and through the world. Uh, Amnesty International came out a year or two ago and said we are all for legalizing the sex trade everywhere. And it's like children will be raped. Uh, Don't do this. You can't do this. Children have to be put first. Yeah, that that's a complicated issue. I really don't know enough about it, but obviously you've seen the inner workings of how these industries work and it's almost like some things are safe and and some things are unsafe. It's like almost like there's almost like a drug analogy here too, right? Like some things can be legalized in a safe way that doesn't create more risk, but other things are just too damn dangerous. Like Exactly. It's that it's that kind of debate yeah. and it's complex. Yeah. It is, it is very complex for sure. Well, Tim, thank you so much. This has been an incredible story. Obviously, you're an incredible guy. How many kids do you have now? I'm afraid to ask. I know. <laughs> I so we 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 had a prenup, you know, unwritten. Six kids was what my wife. We had, we both came from six. She wanted six. I said, fine. If that's what it takes to marry you, you're gonna get six. And then these two kids came along. Okay. And we we and then we got those two. That was funny. Is while while we were going through the adoption process, defying all science, somehow my wife got pregnant. So now we're sitting at nine, Jordan. <laughs> we're sitting at nine wow. kids. <laughs> wow. Well, uh, that's a, yeah. Okay. That's a lot of kids. That's a lot of kids. So you have a job, a full-time, more than full-time job and nine kids and your wife, I assume has no free time whatsoever. No free time kids. whatsoever, but, 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 but we're happy. Yeah. That's incredible, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks again for doing this. This has just been such an enlightening and incredible story and, uh, it, it leaves you some hope in what sounds like an almost uh, un- just hopeless situation, a hopeless uh, scenario that you face all the time with your organization as well. We believe we believe there is hope, and and we hope to have that flag of of not just awareness and but but there's a solution, and and we think we're on to it. So thank you, Jordan, yeah. for being willing to even listen to this because I know it's just so hard to listen to and to the audience. Thank you for not turning us off. And, and listening to this whole thing because we need you. We need all of you. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the show. Remember, you can find all of our full interviews on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere you listen to audio podcasts as most of our interviews are in the podcast feed. Now click here to subscribe to the show. Click here for an interview with Dallas Mavericks owner and entrepreneur from Shark Tank, Mark Cuban, and click here for an interview with Stephen Coffeezilla where we take down fake guru scammers both online and off.